Welcome, everyone. We'll get started. My name is Rebecca Slayton. I'm the director of the Judith Repi Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies. I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture by Professor David Courtright. Uh, this is a university lecture. University lectureships are the highest recognition of scholarship awarded by Cornell. University lecturers must model interdisciplinary excellence with support for their uh, lectureship coming from at least three different departments on campus. Support for Professor Courtright's uh, lectureship came from uh, far beyond that. Um, it included faculty from history, government, sociology, law, science and technology studies, and natural resources. Um, faculty from all of those departments joined hands in nominating Professor Courtright to the university lectureship. The Repi Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies, an interdisciplinary program at Cornell, also strongly supported Professor Courtright's lectureship and his appointment as a visiting scholar at the Institute. So why are we all excited um, to be welcoming Professor David Courtright? Uh, I'll quote from one of his letters of nomination. Professor Courtright is, quote, one of the foremost scholars of interdisciplinary peace studies. He has authored or edited 22 books, including Governance for Peace, published by U Cambridge University Press in 2017, Gandhi and Beyond, published by Paradigm in 2009, Peace, A History of Movements and Ideas, published in 2008, and Soldiers in Revolt, GI Resistance During the Vietnam War. Institutionally, Professor Courtright is Professor Emeritus of the Practice at the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. Before that, he was the Director of Policy Studies at the Keough School's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and the Director of the Institute's Peace Accords Matrix Project, the largest existing collection of implementation data on intrastate peace agreements. His research and writing have focused on nonviolent social change, nuclear disarmament, and the use of multilateral sanctions and incentives as tools of international peacemaking. He has provided research services to the foreign ministries of Canada, Denmark, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Switzerland, and has served as a consultant or advisor to agencies of the United Nations, the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict, the International Peace Acad Academy, and the John T. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Uh, before turning things over to Professor Courtright, I just want to reiterate the timeliness of today's lecture. When we nominated uh, Professor Courtright to the university lectureship, we were about one year into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has killed nearly 10,000 civilians to date. Uh, by the time Professor Courtright arrived on campus, we were watching the horrific escalation of violence in Israel and Palestine. Uh, which has killed more than 11,000 Palestinians in Gaza, 1,400 Israeli citizens. Um, about 40% of the Palestinians are children. On Friday, the World Health Organization reported that a child is being killed in Gaza about every 10 minutes on average. So these recent events are a constant reminder of the urgent need to seek nonviolent approaches to resolving conflict. And so with that in mind, please welcome me and join Professor Courtright. Thank you so very much, Rebecca. And I feel so honored to be invited to be delivering a university lecture and to be part of the Repi Institute. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for us to be here, uh, and I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, on these on these issues. Um, the theme of my talk today is lessons from and for peace movements. And my life story, my personal history, tracks the history of those peace movements from the Vietnam peace movement of the 60s and 70s to the nuclear freeze and disarmament movements of the 1980s, and then the effort to try to stop the invasion and occupation of Iraq in the 2000s. And I will talk about each of those, especially those latter two movements in my remarks. But before beginning my main address, I thought I would share with you a bit of my personal story and maybe some of the episodes that I experienced in working to fight against the nuclear arms race. My students often ask how I became interested in peace. And for me, it was an unusual journey. I was drafted into the army for the Vietnam War. I graduated from the university in 1968, which was an unfortunate time to be an available young man in America. The war was raging, the military draft was at its peak. So to avoid being drafted into the infantry, I volunteered for the Army Band. 
Yes, I defended our country by playing my trumpet and baritone horn. I was hoping to just skate by and get on with my life after the army, but my conscience wouldn't allow it. As I talked to the guys who were coming back from Nam and saw what was happening there, I was shocked, I was horrified. So I did a very subversive thing. I studied the history of the war and of the Vietnamese people. And I quickly realized that what our political leaders and military commanders were saying was completely wrong. We were slaughtering thousands of civilians whose only crime was the desire to be free of foreign domination. I went through a period of personal anguish, uh, difficulty. A colleague later said I was having a crisis of conscience. Uh, but I eventually decided I just could not continue business as usual. I could not be quiet about a war that was so moral and, and unjust. And if I was ordered to go, I would have to refuse. I began to speak out as an active duty soldier. I became part of the GI peace movement. One of my first actions was to pose for this uh, poster. <laughs> That's picture of me a thousand years ago. Um, and it was part of the anti-war movement, the Student Mobilization Committee. And it's not about me, it's about the thinking soldier, about the dissenting soldiers, of which there were many of us in those days. Uh, fellows in my unit and I signed a petition to end the war that was signed by eventually 1,300 soldiers from around the world and was published as a full page ad in the New York Times. We were excited and thrilled about that achievement. Uh, but our commanders were not amused uh, and they threatened us with punishments, but we refused to be silenced. Then they cracked down on us uh, with punitive transfers and onerous duty assignments. So we filed a lawsuit in federal district court. technical difficulties. Well, we filed our lawsuit, as I mentioned, and we actually won at the federal district court level, although it was overturned by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, and a footnote to this in history, in recent years, I was contacted by one of the sitting judges in the Second Circuit who asked, are you David Portwright? Yeah. Can we interview you? And they've created a reenactment of our court case that's being used for continuing legal education through the federal end of court within the Second Circuit. So I've been reliving that whole experience on several, several occasions. Maybe we can do it here at the uh, Cornell Law School as well. Yeah. So we, we lost the case in, on legal principles, but we made a statement politically that many soldiers were opposing the war. And this was then my beginning of a dedication and interest in peace and peace research, and I've not veered from that path since. In the 1970s, I was asked to be the director of SANE, the Committee for a SANE Nuclear Policy, and played a role in helping to support the nuclear weapons freeze campaign and the larger disarmament movement. One of our successful campaigns was the movement to stop the MX missile. Uh, maybe some of you remember that program. It was one of the largest nuclear weapons programs ever devised, a centerpiece of the Reagan nuclear buildup. A plan for building 200 new ICBMs, each capable of carrying 10 hydrogen bombs, deployed in a massive mobile basing system in the Great Basin of Utah and Nevada, covering 25,000 square miles, five times the size of Connecticut. The idea was to move the missiles around constantly so that the Soviets couldn't target or destroy them. It was a lunatic scheme and cartoonists had a field day. And, uh, one of the humorists who commented on it was Art Buchwald. And he said, well, I have a better plan for the Pentagon. It'll save a lot of money. Why don't we place the missiles on the Amtrak trains? <laughs> They're never on time. We never know where they are. And the Kremlin could never find out how to destroy them. Uh, the racetrack plan was succumbed to local citizen opposition, which we supported. So the Pentagon developed other plans for the missile, one of which was deep underground missile bases for which the acronym is DUMB. Uh, that's true. The mobile basing system was canceled and we fought against the missile for years and cut it down from 200 to 50 missiles. And just one more anecdote and story of one of our accomplishments. 
was to block the Reagan administration's civil defense program, one of the most absurd federal programs ever devised, the Crisis Relocation Plan. Remember that one? Uh, the idea was that we could survive and win a nuclear war by evacuating major population centers to nearby rural areas. The crisis relocation plan called for evacuating cities over a three-day period. In New York City, that meant moving 11 million people. The idea was that when the attack was coming, we would all be notified. No one would panic. On the first day, people whose cars had an even number of plates would drive out of the out into the country, while those with odd number plates would wait patiently and calmly for their turn the next day. New York's normally contested highways would have no jams. All cars would flow smoothly, fully fueled, no breakdowns, no accidents. And of course, all those generous people in eastern Pennsylvania and upstate New York would welcome the urban refugees with open arms and share their food, fuel, and homes with them. So there's been some craziness over the years in this struggle for peace. It's continued over the decades, and today, as Rebecca said, we face enormous new challenges. The vast human suffering in Gaza and Israel and the war between Russia and Ukraine challenge us in ways that we have never experienced in decades, perhaps not in our lifetimes. Rarely has it been more difficult to talk about peace and the role of peace movements but never has it been more urgent to do so. We are pained by what we are witnessing, but we're uncertain about what to say or do. Some peace scholars and activists prefer not to talk about it at all. In late September, I attended the annual conference of the Peace and Justice Studies Association and found not a single panel or speaker addressing the war in Ukraine. Recently, I was invited to speak at a meeting of a regional peace group was, but was advised not to make the war in Ukraine the subject of my talk because members of the group were sharply divided about it. Well, I've never been good at following orders or shying away from controversy, so of course I went ahead and talked about Ukraine and the crisis in Gaza. How could I do otherwise as a scholar and activist for peace? If we want peace, we have to address the challenges of war. If we believe that nonviolence is the superior approach for resolving conflict, we must show that it is that provides solutions to the problems that violence purports to address, but in a better, less costly, and more sustainable way. In this presentation, I hope to explain why movements matter and how they can influence policy, drawing principally from the Iraq anti-war movement and the nuclear disarmament movement. I begin with some general observations about the effectiveness of peace movements and how they attempt to exert influence on policy. I then consider strategies first in Gaza and then for Ukraine. I examine alternative means for countering violent extremism in research showing that military responses are ineffective and often counterproductive. I look critically at the growing worldwide movement for ceasefire, in Gaza, I address the necessity of finding diplomatic solutions for the conflict. In the second part of my talk, I, I examine Russian aggression in Ukraine and the dilemma of supporting Ukraine's self-defense while also seeking an end to the war. I focus on Russia's sinister threats to use nuclear weapons and the unraveling of the negotiated arms agreements that mark the end of the Cold War and argue there as well for an international diplomatic process to end the war. In the final section, I recall some lessons from the nuclear freeze movement, especially the value of a bilateral approach and the importance of religious community involvement to offer observations on building more effective movements for peace in Gaza and in Ukraine today. History shows that peace movements are able to shape policy if they can build large coalitions, have compelling, and unifying demands and are persistent in applying pressure for change. The ways in which social movements influence policy are not always apparent. They often emerge in unexpected manner or have effects far into the future. It is always too early to calculate effect, wrote Rebecca Solnit, 
We can never know how our actions today will influence events for tomorrow. When we apply pressure, we can't predict how political establishments will respond. Movements may win even as they appear to lose. The Iraq anti-war movement was unable to stop the invasion. Despite massive global opposition, as more than 10 million people demonstrated in hundreds of cities around the world on February 15, 2003, which was the largest single day of anti-war protest in history. But the Bush administration pushed ahead with the invasion despite the unprecedented opposition. Although the global protests presented, uh, sorry, prevented Germany, Canada, Turkey, and other countries from joining the so-called Coalition of the Willing. And the UN Security Council twice rebuffed US and British attempts to gain authorization for the use of force. Here in the US, opposition to the war and occupation continued and helped the Democratic Party win control of Congress in 2006 and establish a legislative mandate for the withdrawal of troops. Barack Obama won the Democratic nomination and the presidency on the basis of his opposition to the war. And as president, followed through on his pledge to withdraw the troops. As we address the conflict in Gaza, it's appropriate to reflect upon the Iraq war experience and the movement against it. There are obvious tragic parallels between that experience and the current crisis in Gaza. When President Biden traveled to Israel right after the October 7 massacre, he warned Prime Minister Netanyahu not to repeat the mistake that the United States made in the aftermath of 9-11. That mistake was not in the tactics of military operations as some commentators suggested, but in the fundamental decision to go to war, to wage a so-called global war on terror, which proved to be a colossal strategic miscalculation. The Iraq anti-war movement was born in the debate about how to respond to 9-11. Peace, human rights, and religious groups came together to say that war is not the answer. We warned that Military intervention will lead to more terrorism, not less. Students began to organize. Those were the early days of the internet and an online petition quickly gathered half a million signatures, one of the very first to go viral. It called for sober restraint and a just and effective response to the 9-11 attacks. The National Council of Churches, the US Catholic bishops and many other religious voices pointed to the human cost of war and the many innocent civilians who would die from war in the Middle East. They endorsed a statement that was published in the New York Times that said, let us deny the terrorists their victory by refusing to, to submit to a world created in their image. Catholic ethicist Father Brian Hare wrote that countering terrorism is a function of police and legal networks. War is an indiscriminate tool for this highly discriminating task, he wrote. Many national security experts echoed that judgment, including former national security advisor, Brent Scowcroft, who wrote in the Wall Street Journal that an invasion of Iraq would seriously jeopardize, if not destroy, the global counterterrorism campaign and would generate a worldwide explosion of outrage against the United States. Peace researchers identified alternatives to the use of force, Support the UN counterterrorism program for international police and intelligence cooperation, we wrote. Make greater efforts to resolve the conditions that give rise to these conflicts through diplomacy and peace building and greater investment in economic and social development. In Iraq, we argued for a more effective UN arms embargo and targeted sanctions to contain the threat posed by Saddam Hussein. We joined with diplomats at the UN in calling for renewed UN inspections to test the claim of weapons of mass destruction. Inspections, not war, was our slogan. The core message was then and remains today that we can fight against violent extremism without war. Win without war became the slogan and the name of the organization we created. And the group still exists as a leading voice for progressive foreign policy, arguing for non-military solutions in Gaza, Ukraine, and beyond. A 2008 study by the Rand Corporation found that most terrorist groups end through either effective policing or political agreements. Military force accounted for the demise of terror groups in only 7% of the cases. 
Audrey Kurth Cronin's major work, How Terrorism Ends, comes to similar conclusions. Their study of hundreds of cases of counterterrorism policy finds that violent repression does not work and is often the catalyst of further extremism. Here is another important lesson for peace movements. Show that there are really constructive alternatives. Groups like Hamas commit atrocities and maximize civilian casualties precisely to provoke a disproportionate response from their declared enemy. Their goal is to increase the overall level of violence and polarization, generating additional recruits and support for their cause. Waging war to counter terrorism is a fool's errand, a trap that entangles the warring state in prolonged, costly, and debilitating wars of counterinsurgency and military occupation. Sadly, Israel has fallen into that trap. No one can deny Israel's right to defend itself or the necessity of preventing future terrorist strikes. But the massive bombing of densely populated neighborhoods and cities and the killing of thousands of civilians, including so many children, is unconscionable. It's immoral and illegal. It is also counterproductive to the goal of enhancing Israeli security. The siege of Gaza perpetuates the cycle of violence and suffering that has afflicted the region for so long. It also distracts attention from the heinous crimes committed by Hamas. Look at the press coverage and the social media. It's mostly about Palestinian suffering, with little attention to the more than 1,200 Israelis who were massacred on October 7, or the fate of the more than 200 hostages illegally abducted by Hamas. The longer the killing of people in Gaza continues, the worse the situation will become for Israel. I support justice for the Palestinian people, but nothing can justify the crimes Hamas has committed in their name. Even if one accepts the right of resistance, there can be no justification for intentionally targeting unarmed civilians. I recommend the incisive commentary on Hamas's multiple war crimes by Cornell Law Dean Olin in Opinion of Yours. People all over the world, including many in the US, are now protesting against Israel's military assault and are calling for a ceasefire. The appeal for a ceasefire has become the core political demand for ending the violence. It can serve as the basis for a genuine international peace movement. The messaging in many of the rallies is one-sided and divisive, however, and alienates people who otherwise support the anti-war cause, including many progressive Jews. Especially troubling is the slogan from the river to the sea. It was discussed in an article in the Times today. While it may be intended as an aspiration for the freedom of all people in Israel and Palestine, many hear and fear it as a call for the elimination of the Israeli state, perhaps its people. Phrases that are so divisive and open to conflicting interpretation are an obstacle to building the broad coalitions that are necessary for successful movements. There is division among governments and activists over this question of ceasefire or pause. The most important point about the word ceasefire, in my opinion, is its directionality. It makes ending the war an essential strategic objective and affirms there is no military solution to this conflict. To this conflict. <laughs> Opponents of the war can be agnostic about the choice of words, I believe, as long as the intention is clearly to stop the killing. Any step that halts the violence, even if it, for, it is for a limited time, is welcome. It provides a basis for demanding a more permanent pause. It opens space for humanitarian assistance. I'm reminded of the Iraq debate when activists lobbied Congress in 2007 for the withdrawal of US troops. Supportive members of Congress substituted the word redeployment for withdrawal. It was a tactic for winning support among moderate legislators. The new wording meant the same thing regarding the removal of troops from Iraq, but many activists were skeptical. In the end, they supported the newly worded measure, which was approved by both houses of Congress and ultimately became US policy. Linguistic debates also emerged during the freeze movement when the US Catholic bishops issued 
a widely anticipated and influential pastoral letter in 1983 that urged a halt to the arms race, but did not use the word freeze. Some argued this was a setback for the movement, but the bishops remained steadfast in supporting arms reduction and disarmament. Whether we call it a pause or a ceasefire, a cessation of hostilities is necessary, but it's not enough. Peace research tells us that ceasefires break down frequently. They are often merely a pause. The sustainability of a ceasefire depends upon effective third-party monitoring and a political process for addressing underlying grievances. In this case, a ceasefire or pause must be tied to a long-term political process, ideally under UN authority, for attempting to achieve a just political settlement between the Israeli and Palestinian people. I can almost see the eyes rolling. Give me a break. It can't work. It's been tried and failed. There are too many spoilers. Yes, the obstacles are many and seemingly endless, but ultimately there is no alternative to negotiations. War and violence have been tried repeatedly, endlessly, and they are rampant again now. They have not brought peace to Palestine and never will. The only hope for peace is through a negotiated political process in which the UN plays a key role. We can't be naive about the enormous difficulties of this or the length of time required. For starters, we don't even have legitimate negotiating partners on either side. Hamas has disqualified itself. Its leaders belong in the docket at The Hague, not at the negotiating table. They do not want a political agreement. War is their strategy and the destruction of Israel their goal. A new form of political representation in Palestine will be needed, although how that will occur, we can't know. In Israel as well, the Netanyahu government has utterly failed in its most fundamental duty of protecting its citizens from attack and has forfeited its diminishing political legitimacy. We must remain relentless in demanding an end to the violence and working with the UN and other states to establish an internationally monitored ceasefire and diplomatic negotiations to achieve a just political settlement. The call for negotiations is also the essential strategy for ending the war in Ukraine. It's a sad commentary on the savagery of the Gaza war that it has eclipsed coverage of the brutal war in Ukraine as that story slips out of consciousness. The carnage continues, however, after almost two years of relentless industrial scale war with no end in sight and still no clarity among many peace advocates about what should be done. The Ukraine war is similar to the Iraq war as a blatant example of military aggression, a direct violation of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter, which prohibits, which prohibits states from using military force against another state, except in self-defense against an attack. The fact that the US also violated the charter by invading Iraq is no justification for Russia doing the same in Ukraine. Although Washington's double standard has made it more difficult for the US to mobilize support for Ukraine. Many pacifists, no, sorry, many peace activists are implicitly pacifist and have difficulty accepting the concept of a just war. If such a thing exists, however, Ukraine's determined struggle to defend itself surely qualifies as a just cause. It is a battle for national survival against a declared intention to eliminate Ukraine as a separate country and culture. Pope Francis, the stalwart defender of peace and disarmament, has said that Ukraine's defensive war is, quote, not only licit, it's also an expression of love toward one's homeland. Even when war is for self-defense, however, it must be viewed with sorrow. War is always a defeat for humanity, declared. Pope John Paul II, we have a moral duty to work for an end to armed conflict and to build the conditions for sustainable peace. This means seeking a just termination of this war. This is especially so now as the struggle has become a war of attrition, as even the Ukrainian military commander has admitted. These conditions create a moral imperative for pursuing 
a diplomatic strategy to end the war. Many Ukrainians share President Zelensky's skepticism about peace talks, but there is nothing to fear from diplomacy and much to gain with the right strategy. Negotiations are not a concession to the enemy, and there would be no need to abandon defensive military operations, at least not at first. The goal would remain to assure the withdrawal of Russian troops and the restoration of Ukrainian authority and sovereignty over its territory. The goal of negotiations also should be to prevent the use of nuclear weapons, which Russian leaders have threatened repeatedly, and to restore the shattered foundations of U.S.-Russian nuclear arms limitation. We are in a moment of unprecedented nuclear peril, as the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists symbolized recently by moving its doomsday clock closer to midnight than it has ever been before. Russia has used the threat of nuclear weapons as a shield to pursue its military aggression. When Putin launched the invasion, he ordered nuclear forces to, quote, combat duty. Foreign Minister Lavrov repeated those threats, saying that the threat of nuclear war cannot be underestimated. Former President Dmitry Medvedev just a few months ago said, every day they provide Ukraine with foreign weapons brings the nuclear apocalypse closer. Russia's nuclear threats come on the heels of the systematic erosion of the arms reduction and disarmament agreements that ended the Cold War. The Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Conventional Forces in Europe Agreement, Open Skies, they're all gone. The START nuclear treaty is hanging by a thread. And just this past week, Putin signed a law ending Russian participation in the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. This dismantlement of negotiated arms reduction takes with it the historic legacy of the peace and disarmament movement. Recall the nuclear freeze movement and the mass mobilizations for disarmament that swept through Western society in the 1980s. Scientists, physicians, religious leaders, former diplomats and military commanders, citizens in every walk of life in the United States and Western Europe spoke out for ending the arms race and abolishing nuclear weapons. In the United States, a million people marched to Central Park in June 1982 to call for freezing re and reversing the arms race. At the heart of that movement was a proposal developed by MIT researcher Randall Forsberg, the call for a bilateral US-Soviet freeze on the testing, production, and deployment of nuclear weapons. That proposition was presented to 18 million voters in non-binding referenda in 1982. The freeze was approved in nine out of 10 states and in dozens of major cities where it was on the ballot. During the 1980s, the freeze movement and the disarmament movement generally stopped the deployment of the MX mobile system, curtailed funding for nuclear testing, the Strategic Defense Initiative, and other necessary and dangerous weapon systems. In response, Ronald Reagan altered his bellicose rhetoric and promised to negotiate with the Soviets. He followed through on those pledges when Gorbachev came to power and the two leaders negotiated agreements for unprecedented nuclear weapons reduction. As Matthew Evangelista has written, citizens played an important role in reducing the nuclear danger and ending the Cold War. This university had a role in these events. Scientists here helped to initiate the historic pledge signed by more than 7,000 US physicists, mathematicians, chemists, and other physical scientists vowing not to work on the Strategic Defense Initiative. The papers of Freeze founder Randy Forsberg are archived here at the Cornell University Library at the initiative of the Rappi Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies, where I'm proud to serve as a visiting scholar. The Rappi Institute also convened a valuable symposium in 2018 to reflect on the posthumous release of Forsberg's study on abolishing war, which was published by Cornell University Press. The genius of the freeze was that it applied to both sides, the US and the Soviet Union. Previous disarmament campaigns in the US were aimed largely at Washington, rightly so, since the US was the driver of the arms race initially. But campaigns directed only at the US faced the false charge of being communist inspired and pro-Soviet. When groups such as SANE campaigned for a test ban in the late 50s and early 60s, they were often, 
accused of having communist connections. The organization was seriously damaged by red baiting attacks from members of Congress and the press. The freeze changed all of that. It was an appeal directed at both sides. European disarmaments also applied the bilateral logic of the freeze by directing their protests at both NATO and Soviet missiles with their slogans, no to cruise and Pershing, no to SS-22. SS-20. The even-handed approach of opposing nuclear weapons on both sides helped to inoculate the movement from charges of being pro-Soviet. It made it easier for diverse groups to support the freeze. It undermined the logic of the arms race and helped to end the Cold War. The legitimacy of the movement was also enhanced by the support it received from religious communities, as I've mentioned. Practically every religious body in the US endorsed the freeze and urged a halt to the arms race. Especially important was the support of the Catholic bishops. No one could credibly claim that the fiercely anti-communist and conservative prelates of the Catholic Church were communist. These are additional lessons for mobilizing opposition and can be relevant for the campaigns against wars today. Calls for ending the siege in Gaza will be more effective if they combine the demand for a cessation of Israeli military operations with a firm condemnation of Hamas's October 7 atrocities. It will also be more effective and have greater legitimacy if they have the backing of representatives from all three major faith traditions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. This dual approach is also needed in Ukraine, I believe. The US should continue to provide aid for Ukrainian self-defense, contrary to what some on the far left and Republican reactionaries in Congress are urging. But we should also press for negotiations to end the war ideally through a broad international process. A peace agreement in Ukraine would need vigorous third-party monitoring and should be tied to a UN authorized diplomatic process for resolving the status of the illegally annexed territories. The current US and EU sanctions against Russia can provide leverage for encouraging negotiations. Pressures should be intensified to cut Russian energy earnings and imports of weapons and military related technology, while the offer to ease and lift sanctions can be used as an inducement to encourage Russian concessions. To date, the Biden administration has argued that the question of negotiation is up to the Ukrainian government. In light of present political realities and the stalemate on the battlefield, however, this is no longer a viable position. It is necessary for the US and the European Union to use their leverage with Ukraine to urge participation in a diplomatic process for reaching a political agreement to the conflict, working with China, Turkey, and other countries that have offered to help. The horrors of the Ukraine war and the increasing nuclear danger are inextricably intertwined, and they need, need to be resolved in parallel. Agreem agreements to reduce nuclear arms and restructure US Russia security relations need to be part of a diplomatic strategy for ending the war. Negotiating for disarmament means returning to the, not working, means returning to the Reagan Gorbachev agenda of nuclear arms reduction that animated East West policy just 35 years ago. That era of striving for a nuclear weapons free world may seem hopelessly distant now amidst the sorrows of war, but it is necessary to maintain the vision and attempt to move in that direction. As we witnessed during the Iraq anti-war and nuclear disarmament movements, people have the power to influence policy. It can help to make history. We must exercise that power now to hasten the end of the bitter conflicts of today, to forge a more unified movement to end the siege of Gaza and begin a new political process for the mutual security of the Israeli and Palestinian people, and to initiate an international diplomatic process to end the war in Ukraine and resume the process of nuclear arms reduction to enhance global security. Perhaps this great university can play a leading role again now as we confront the present dangers in helping to illuminate pathways to negotiation and cooperation rather than hostility and war. Thank you.
Thank you.